We apologize for this brief interruption in the show. As many of you likely know, the Higher Standard Podcast is officially sponsored by Transcend Company. Transcend has been my longtime provider for both testosterone and peptide therapies, but they offer so much more. Whether you're interested in health, wellness, or longevity, it all begins with you getting your blood work done. A lab draw will help you get the numbers and establish your baseline. You can go to transcendcompany.com slash THSP. That's transcendcompany.com slash THSP. Or you can click the link in the show notes on any streaming platform and on YouTube. Fill out your information and one of the representatives will contact you to get your journey started today. Now back to the show. Yeah, how long was that? Hour and a half? Hour and a half. Uh, hour and 40. Hour and 40, yeah. yeah. That's, that's all right because, yeah, three yeah. half-hour clips in a 10-minute. One, bump. two, three, right. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. He can count. But he just forgot to uh, hit the timer. He didn't hit the clock. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look. There's always something. You can put the man in a nice dress shirt, but you can't take the boy out the man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good show, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> we did it, boys and girls. Yeah, yeah. It's not getting any better from here. Welcome back to the number one financial literacy podcast in the world. Sitting next to me, my partner in time, the one and only the man who makes my dreams come true. Saito Marva. Oh, thank you, man. Sitting next to me is my partner in crime, Chris Nahibi, the one that makes my dreams come true. On your left or on your right? Uh, my left. <laughs> We're working on it. It's fine. Yeah. yeah it's, it's all good. I understand. And the uh, the ambidextrous man in the back laughing his ass off, that's DJ Aru. That's always mm. awesome. With the Euro step. Euro step, yeah. Oh, man. A little bit of a side step. I understand that basketball reference. You do? Yeah. Good for you. Barely, but I got it. We got it. We got you there. All the Euros were coming into the league when I was coming out. So <laughs> Got it. Makes total sense to me. And Arun, just, just for the record, you are in the middle of the screen again trying to make me read like an idiot. Jesus Christ. Yes, I am Jesus Christ. Like an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is episode 199. Woo! So close to the top, kids. We're almost there. I we're, hope you're ready. We're retiring at 200, right? We got a special episode for episode 200. Yeah. Are we, should we tease the full content? You like teasing? A little tease. It's Baller Busters Chapter 2 mm. with a guest. With a guest. Yes, a very sensational guest, if I don't say so myself. Very handsome guest. Not me, the world guest. World renowned. Yeah. He, oh, he is world renowned. That's actually That's true. right. Yeah. 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 So uh, we, we, did, uh, we did a big thing. Yeah. Big boy pants are on. <laughs> yeah. And it was a great episode. Make sure you tune in and check it out. And uh, until then, let's just talk about uh, the economy. Let's do it. So much went on. Yeah, I did not. Actually, the. The show notes weren't this filled until like the last day or two. Yeah. So I guess the last couple of days really picked up because uh, I was three days ago. I was like, ah, shit, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> Not realizing that PCE was coming out. I totally forgot. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was kind of lost in my head just with everything that's got to do for the, the podcast consumes my mental stat. You, you, you find this problem too? Yes. All the time. Arun, you too? Constantly thinking about it. Come on. You already know the answer. The answer is no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just care. Yeah. For me, it, it consumes me. Like I'm constantly thinking about like tinkering and what I have to get done and like deliverable dates and stuff. Mm -hmm. We really need an editor. We need an editor. If you know somebody, tell them to reach out. We're actually hiring. So yeah, job posting is it's on. live. Surprisingly, a lot of uh, submissions for the job that doesn't pay anything. Yeah. I mean, it pays. <laughs> I mean, it pays. Yeah. It pays. Just, and it, it pays those. Right. And it will pay if you have faith in us growing. Oh, look at that. That's called an equity. See what I did there? An equity payment, if you will. Yeah. Anyway, uh, inflation continues to cool in the month of October. Uh, I was not really surprised by the numbers, but I think they're worth, worthy of a discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. cost of living, I'm uh, feeling a little squeezed. Well, one website did the math, and uh, it is going to sound a lot like the stuff that we talk about in the show. So you know we naturally have a tendency to talk about the things that we could say we told you so about. <laughs> it's one this, of our favorite this, topics. This is just one of those things. <laughs> Consumers pulled back on spending. Inflation eased in October. Uh, so we kind of knew the student loan uh, repayment was going to have a, a pretty pretty quick impact, and it seems that it has. Mm -hmm. Median new versus existing home sale price has got some interesting data coming out. That one, again, from my favorite, pay, my favorite uh, X page, the Kobisi letter. Kobisi? Kobisi letter, yeah. I heard him say it had his own last name, so now I'm... I'm convinced that that's the appropriate way to say it. I mean, assuming he knows how to say his own last name. I mean, you don't know how to say your own last name. I really don't. It's very confusing. <laughs> is the G silent? Is it not? Yeah. Nahibi sounds a whole lot easier than Nahibi. Yeah. <laughs> Nahibi. I don't do that. I don't want to spit anybody. GD flee. GD flee. G 
GDP Ooh, inflation it's be one of those nights. data bolsters a case that the Fed is done hiking, and that'll be a resounding theme. Everything we're going to talk about tonight will probably make you think, hmm, the Fed is done done hiking, I think. Uh, who predicted it first? I think you did. I did. Yeah. yeah but you co-signed it. I did co-sign it. Um, I just felt that you needed the boost. Thank you. You're welcome. I need all the boosts. Fed's Waller expresses confidence that policy is in the right place to bring down inflation. All the housing bulls, uh, everybody who's in the housing space, builders, all those economists in that sector were like fucking reposting the shit out of Waller's comments. Yeah. They were just you know slapping themselves and pinching their nipples. They were all happy about this <laughs> shit. And I get it. The, the Fed's Waller, who typically is uh, pretty, um, pretty aggressive, mm-hmm. to come out and you know provide a statement of, hey, feel like we're in the right place. Yeah. That was uh that was in their mind a win. Yeah, exactly. I think the market reacted that way too. And investors are hungry for risk and holding record cash sums. But uh, we're going to end with a little bit of Charlie Munger. We have to. Charlie Munger passed away at the ripe old age of ninety nine, as I lovingly pointed out. One uh, one short of a hundo makes me feel bad. I wanted him to make it there. I get it, but uh, he lived a long, full, and seemingly happy life. Yes. And uh, for all you fitness models out there, he and Warren Buffett made a uh, pretty consistent habit of burgers and uh, Cokes. Yeah. It ain't going to get you to the end, kids. <laughs> you know? No. You might look pretty, but you probably die young. All right. Exactly. Well, shall we get into it? Before we get into it, podcast listeners, whether that's no. on Apple or on Spotify, please make sure you head over and leave us an honest five-star review. It really helps out the show, does a lot for us, and it makes us exceptionally happy. For our YouTube listeners, make sure you subscribe, hit that like button, ring that notification bell, and make sure you do all the goody good stuff. Every time you say it, I think moist. The moist. moist. Do the moist goody good stuff. Moist. Yeah. Do all that, all the moistness that gets your skin all irritable and stuff. <laughs> According to Yahoo Finance, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge hits lowest level since March of 2021. And in case you've been asleep at the wheel, that's inflation, kids. And that is core inflation. Mm -hmm. So the personal consumption expenditures, PCE index, grew 3% year over year for the month, down from 3.4% in September and in line with expectations. Core PCE, which excludes the volatile food and energy categories, grew at 3.5%, down from 3.7%. Both indicators are going the right direction. For the month prior and in line with what economists surveyed by Bloomberg, had expected month over month core PCE rose 0.2% in October down from 0.3% in September. All right, Chris. So why should people care about this PCE report when we uh, just got a updated CPI report? Core inflation is the preferred metric for the fed and the one they tend to look the closest at for a true indicator of what inflation is really doing. Yes, exactly. Right. So and if this is the metric that they're looking at and this is believed to be coming down on a, you know, downward trend, then you can hope for easing to come a little bit sooner than what had recently been coming out. Not too long ago, the predictions were that rate cuts would happen in July. As of today, the CME Chicago Mercantile Exchange Fed Watch tool is now starting to price in a 40 percent chance at a rate cut in March. Mm. I don't know that that's going to happen then. I got to be honest with you. I, I know I've, I've been hearing the rhetoric. And so what happens is, is like good news comes out and then all the economists are like, Ooh, gummy, yum, 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 They got all excited and stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. And then what do they do? They start moving up their rate cut prediction because they feel like, Oh, it's moving the right way. And then if you look at this and they talk about, okay, core inflation has moved down to a pretty healthy number, mm-hmm. right? It's what 3.4%. Is that what that was? Core inflation is at 3.5%. 3.5%. Okay, sorry. 3.5%. 3.5%. They're going, okay, you're not too far off from the 2 to 3% target range. They're targeting 2%, obviously. But again, I think that that last, you know, percent and a half is going to be really, really difficult for them to get. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't know that I see them really cutting before then. Waller came out and also mentioned that, he, look, we might be at restrictive enough territory because you have to remember, mm-hmm. if the headline figure is at 3%, and the Fed funds rate is at 5.25 to 5.5%. Remember, there's always that little 25 basis point gap range, yep. right? We're at approximately 1.75% restrictive territory, right? It's that much higher than inflation. So when it's, it starts to get that much higher, the gap between the two, it's supposed to you know, put even more pressure, downward pressure. Raphael Bostic, uh, Fed president out of Atlanta. I still think it's Bostic. 
Bostic. Okay, we'll go with Bostic. Okay. He uh, he's a voting member, so he's got a seat at the table. Not Neil Kashkari. Not your boy Kashkari. Yeah, he's got the crayons at the small table, right? <laughs> they sit him off outside the room. Neil, <laughs> give, give me some tea. <laughs> tea. Yeah. I'm not going to drink it. I just want him to go get me something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then I want him to watch me not drink it. Right. <laughs> um. So Bostic himself came out and said that he too, like Waller, believes we're at the right place. Where, where the Fed funds rate is at, and he thinks that we're start we're at a place where we're starting to see downward pressure. So the reason why people are starting to think that they may cut at the beginning of the year next year, remember the Fed, their target uh, rate of inflation is two percent, and they have routinely said that we don't need to get to our target rate of two percent inflation for us to begin cutting. We just need to feel like we're on a downward trend. And it's going to consistently keep going down because they're also very aware that even when they do cut, they're going to pause. and They're going to continue to hold it there. It's not like they're going to be slashing rates. Yeah, I really worry about the, the, the impacts of that, right? So you had the housing market, which hasn't had a massive correction yet. Mm-hmm. Hasn't even had more than a, a, a slight tiny correction. We'll get into some of that later. We talked about that in the last episode, uh, 198 which was really all about the housing market and, and what's, what's current there. So I look at that and I'm afraid like this, this, if that were to happen and mortgage rates were to come down, it could shotgun the housing market up again. Definitely will. So, but then again, the 10 year. So Logan pointed this out from, from housing wire. He pointed out that the 10 year tends to spike up and come back down. Uh, and once it spikes up and starts coming back down, so it spiked up, Pushing mortgage rates about eight percent, right? Not, not too long ago, not right? Too long ago, it spiked up a little about a little above five percent. Pushed mortgage rates up, uh, and now we saw it drop down to a little bit low, below four point three percent this week. After the Fed started to lay the groundwork of maybe we're done, right? Yeah. He, Jerome Powell didn't come out and say it, but that's what everyone took away from that. And then you started to see the ten-year Treasury and the thirty-year Treasury start to come down, and then that put downward pressure on mortgage rates, getting them almost to the six handle again. Which, which had an influx of mortgage applications. And that concerns me because that could spark the real estate values to continue to go up. And if that happens, affordability is, for the foreseeable future, gone. Now, I do think there is a possibility of this yield curve inversion holding the 10-year higher, even if we start cutting the Fed funds rate, which means that your savings, your checking accounts will have their, their rates go down, but loan rates will stay high until the 10-year gets out of the inversion. I think that's probably the most healthy exit for the macro economy. Right. It's going to be really interesting how it all plays out because in order for home prices to come down, there's going to need to be more sellers out there than buyers, right? There just needs to get, there's going to need to be an influx and something's going to need to happen in order for sellers to actually want to sell, right? Yeah. And it's going to be interesting to see how much, how many buyers are waiting on the sideline because they're truly waiting for rates to come down, Right. And how many buyers are on the sidelines because we can't afford anything right now, right? So if a couple more units come online because rates start to drop down a little bit so that they can maybe go into another home, you know, I know there's a mass, there's still, I think California is the number one state where people are moving out of still. It's too expensive here, man. Yeah. Reported by uh, Redfin. Between the taxes and the real estate values, I mean, it is really, really challenging to live in the state. Yeah, exactly. And especially when you only get to write off like 10,000 of your, you know, property taxes. Yeah, it wasn't always that way, man. Yeah. It was not always that way. Exactly. I'm very, 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 very sad about it. Yeah. <laughs> very. <laughs> my, my property taxes actually aren't that bad in the state. It's the out-of-state stuff that's a little bit more. But, uh, Rune, if we go on to the Bloomberg Business Week article. Uh, Bloomberg Business Week did a little uh, how bad is it cost of the living squeeze kind of math. Mm. And uh, really looked at the real cost of inflation versus some of the numbers you're hearing about. And I thought this was a good kind of natural transition from, okay, Core inflation, PCE, is moving the right way. Right. Right? But should we feel better about it? Well, according to this, some of the natural things that we use or that we buy consistently are up significantly higher than just 3.5%. Oh, yeah. So let's just talk about costs related to indoor plants. 21%. Okay, we don't buy a lot of plants. Natural gas, 29%. Mm-hmm. Car insurance up thirty three percent, major appliances twelve percent, curbs curtains twenty percent, used cars thirty five percent, electricity twenty five percent, rent twenty twenty percent. Yeah, 
water, sewage, 16%. Restaurants and food at restaurants specifically, 24% up. Yeah, I'm sure, and I'm sure people are feeling it. Now, these prices are showing comparisons since January of 2020, mm-hmm. and it, now this is comparing it to October of 2023. We know that. So inflation is measuring, you know, how much the rate things are going up in price. Right. right? But, but here's the problem with that metric is even though it's starting to come down, it's still going up in price. Mm-hmm. Just the, the rate of it increasing in price is slowing. Yes, exactly. So the problem for most consumers is from 2020 to now, these things just cost a lot more fucking money. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens when, you know, there's high inflation. That's why the Fed needs to hurt. Hurry up and correct it and not believe that shit is transitory when it's not. But to be clear here, one of the biggest mistakes people make is in this, even the Biden administration's doing this whole bullshit. We're like, you know, shame on you companies for the raising the price of things when inflation was high and, and not cutting it when inflation is moving back. Okay. Biden, I don't know if you know how this works, chief. Maybe it's part of the Bidenomics thing. It's called that wacky financial plan, but uh, that's not how this works. Everybody raises prices. They don't drop them back down. They go, mm, yum, 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 yum. And a great example of it, just in case you want one, Said, I think you were asking for one. Uh-huh. What was that? Would you before? like an example? I would love an example, Chris. Thank you. Arun, would you like an example? Yes, baby. Then you get an example and you get an example. <laughs> okay. uh, Milton Friedman helped design income tax during the wars. How did he do that? World War II, I think it was. Was it World War II? Mm-hmm. I think it was World War II. Yeah. Uh, look that up, Arun. When did Milton Friedman uh, design income tax for, I think, I think it was World War II? In had, any event. Had to have been. It was supposed to be for extra financial stimulus for the government during wartime efforts. Uh, yeah, see here, blah, blah, blah. 1940s and popularized by Milton Friedman in the 1960s as a system in which the state makes payments to the poor when their income falls yeah, below a threshold. Uh, 40s, World War II, yeah. 40s, World War II. Okay, yeah. Well, that did not answer the question at all, Arun. Thank you, job. Thank you for that job. Say, way to be a historian. See? <laughs> exactly. I'm glad, I'm glad I have you here. A student of the game. Student of the game. Yeah, I got a middle finger from outside the window. That, <laughs> that's why you're not allowed in the room, chief. That's why, yeah. Okay. Oh, has been lobbying to get in the room. Actually, he's been lobbying to stay outside of the room. Come on, man. Let me have that. Arun, defend yourself. I don't want to be in there. Okay, see? <laughs> why don't bro, you want to be in here? Bro, how hot's that room going to get with us three in there? But think about it. How many more viewers would we get if it got hot in here? Three sweaty hot bodies in the <laughs> same room. By the way, earlier I didn't get I That we, reminded you of something? Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, because your boy you you referenced your boy Logan from Housing Wire. Yeah. I was like, man, you guys are like best friends now. No, he does he does not like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you guys recited in the same article together. Yeah, we were so uh was that that was CNET, that was a CNET article. That was a CNET article. Yeah, I, I was cited in the CNET article and uh we both gave quotes and I was actually in in Logan's defense, I was actually very like positive. It was very, it was very difficult for me to write, for like for me to have the conversation where I was like, "No, housing is great. I am very happy with the state of the economy. Just be careful. Here's some sound advice on how to buy a home." <laughs> <laughs> now, to be fair, it was a quote, right? You weren't. It wasn't like a video. <laughs> no, it was a quote. I mean, she quoted a conversation yeah. that we had. But here, here's the irony. Here's a sad irony. Is like obviously I was playing to my audience. Yeah, and I knew what she was going for, so yeah. I, I, you, you know, I get gave, to, to give her what she wanted. I gave positive reinforcement, and then I just said, "Don't ever listen to my podcast." <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't ever. <laughs> so then I, I, when it came out, yeah. she sent me the link. It was very kind of her. Most most reporters won't do that, and um, I posted it to social media, and I tagged Logan. I'm like, "Yo, we recorded the same article." He just like hearted it when he saw it. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he he doesn't follow me back. He he knows that I because I'll constantly challenge him on his posts, mm. and he just won't respond to me. Uh, but he's part of like that whole sector, and look, he's a, not a bad guy. I don't get me wrong. No, and he's got a great set of hair. Great fucking hair. It's, God damn. it's disgusting how good his hair is. <laughs> he's got that Arun hair. It's no, it's it's more vertical. No, I know, but it's just like it's dense. It's dense. Yeah, There's a lot there. He could do. Oh, a you lot. got nice hair too. You just buzz it all the time. Oh, thank you, man. You're it wasn't intentional. Su- such I was, a sweetheart. I was no, to not. Chris. Oh, 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 he does not oh, buzz oh, his oh. head all the time. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was so funny as a joke that he laughed at himself. <laughs> it's like it's right, let's get back on point. So Milton Friedman designed the income tax structure mm-hmm. for wartime efforts, and it was supposed to be temporary. One of his biggest regrets that he said near closer towards the end of his death, as life um, at his death, was that he regretted building the income tax system because guess what the government did? They never turned off that spigot. Yep. And we still pay income tax to this day. Mm-hmm. It was never supposed to be a permanent thing. Right. Well, by an administration. I think you're right. Yeah. I think all these companies, shame on these companies. Well, corporations, yeah, took a page out of the government's book, right? Anytime you see like these uh, subscription-based models, right? Mm-hmm. When they have to raise prices due to whatever they're, they're yeah. quote-unquote dealing with with the economy, 
Well, when inflation adjusts, they don't bring their prices back down. Right. So I think the Biden administration and the U.S. government should take the first step, be a leader. Mm-hmm. Get rid of income tax. Guess, hey, let me tell you right now. Guess what's never going to happen? It's never going to happen, bro. <laughs> so you can't, you can't go shame on these companies. It's such a hypocritical thing, man. Especially when you guys are failing billion-dollar budgets. The I mean, Pentagon. Like, just billions of dollars. Just, just missing. Whoops. Yeah. We failed our audit again, boys. <laughs> oh, shit. Sorry. Yeah. Just get a slap on the back of the wrist. So this uh, article was actually uh, originally sent to me via somebody on social media. It was actually that receipt, Rune, if you go back down. Uh, this receipt, it shows a grocery store receipt with many items that we all buy yeah. every single day. And it shows January 2020 price of $45.34 all in for a standard grocery haul. Yeah. And then the October 2023 price of $60.90. Is that what that is? Yeah. Yeah, it's very small print. So, um, but this is the reason why, right, that the Fed likes to look at core inflation because this uh, component of the report is so volatile that a lot can jump up and move move up and down because it gets it's impacted by so many different things around the world. Yeah, but I think most people are hoping for relief, and that that's the misconception. I, yeah. I don't want people to get the misconception. If in, if things go according to the Fed's plan, mm-hmm. if it winds up being gumdrops and lollipops, and we're like, hooray! We made it out alive. Confetti in the air. No recession. We are amazing, America. Look what we did. You know, and Jerome Powell comes out to Snoop Dogg, and you know he has his own version of a Grant Cardone 10X conference and writes yeah. a book. Yeah. His, his success story, his victory lap will be, guess what, guys? I know you're paying 30% more for some of these products, but you're only going to pay 2% more after this year on top of that. Mm-hmm. That's a win for him. Oh, yeah. Big time, of course. So it's like I don't want people to think that there's like this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's not. It, it's it, These prices are still going up. The only hope that this benefits you is that your wages will go up in excess of inflation so that you're making more money as opposed to spending more money. But what do we know? During times like this, businesses become less profitable. Yes. Right? And a lot of companies right now are, you know, if, if companies are giving out, you know, annual raises – they're not even matching that of inflation right now, right? Home values are, are up 42% since 2020. Odin's pulling up here. I mean, in order to be able to afford a home like that, your wages have to go up and interest rates have to come down and values and prices have to come down. And by comparison, from 2016 to 2019, home values were only up 24%. Crazy, man. Yeah, so big, big difference there. Uh, we could go on all, all, all day long, but that this these two articles in a row were, were there meant to set a stage. I do recommend you re- read the, the business uh, Bloomberg Business Week article. I think it's got some great visual depictions of the cost of things that have gone yeah, up. Yeah, they did a really good job of this one. Yeah, the, the, the visual aids here are really, really cool. The, the charts and everything else, it's, it's actually really, really cool. Uh, but not all for the show. I think the next article is kind of the beginning of, of where I wanted to go with some of these topics. Mm-hmm. From the Wall Street Journal, consumers pulled back on spending in October. Now, before I read the quote, I want you to think about the way we laid this out. Number one, we talk about inflation coming down and falling in line with where the Fed wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Number two, hey, prices are still up, guys. Okay? Right. And um, they're still going to be up if the Fed wins. They're not, they're, we're not talking deflation. We're talking just healthy inflation. Right. Okay, well... Consumer pullback uh, on spending October. Fed is poised to leave rates unchanged in December as price pressures ease, according to the things we've already read. Americans slowed their spending in October, and inflation continued cooling as the economy downshifted from a fast-paced third quarter. We believe that student loan repayment has a lot to do with that. Mm-hmm. Consumer spending rose 0.2% in October, down sharply from a 0.7% rise in September. The Commerce Department said Thursday that marked the slowest increase since May. Again, 0.2% spending is down. Right. But it is still an increase, less than 1%, but still an increase in spending. Yeah, exactly. This is the lowest. Remember, this print that came out was the lowest print for this core PCE since April of 2021. So, look, they do have something to be proud about. And this is enough. There's enough here. And what we've seen in other data points for the Fed to not raise uh, again in December. I believe they're meeting on December 13th. Yes, 12th and 13th. Yeah, yeah. the 12th and 13th, right? So, um, and keep in mind, they had they had priced in in their uh, summary of economic projections that they would raise another 25 basis points by the end of the year or, or early next year. And it's starting to look more and more like they're not going to. 
Yeah, I think that's probably accurate. Uh, Room pulled up a great chart. Uh, overall consumer spending changes from a month earlier. If you go back to that long line that goes straight up there in the middle, there you go. January 2023, by far the the most outlier of up positive spending, 1.6 percent. Which made no sense. Now look at the two low months, if you don't mind, the ones that went negative. Yeah, November of 2022 was down 0.1 percent. Mm-hmm. And the other one, March of 2023, down 0.1 percent. Those are negative numbers. Yeah. Those are the only two negative numbers on this chart going back to early 2022, all the way to where we are now. I think you need more of those. I don't know how you get there with some of the Fed's actions, and I don't know if what we're seeing is going to get us there. But you need more of those. I think, you you I, need things to cost less. We we knew that this was this was going to happen though, because look, this is pricing in October. We know that student loan repayments began in October, mm-hmm. right? And even the re- in the retail space, we covered it on a recent episode. Retailers hired less employees for the holiday for this holiday season than any any time in the last five years. So that tells you a lot right there. They're they're not expecting, you know, record numbers, you know, in store. So I feel like we're going to see more and more of that. Maybe. Uh, maybe we will. And I I, oh, I, sh- I should say maybe. I think we are. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very concerned about the consumer, more so than most people have, have been talking about. But I really do think the consumer is in a much worse position than, than we are currently reporting on. Mm-hmm. That's why going back to... It was a year ago. Uh, Brian Moynihan and Bank of America got yes. on my shit list for talking about how strong the consumer was. Yeah, and I think it's only continued to degrade over time. And what bothers me is when the consumer defaults on like debt starts to happen. They're gonna be like, "Oh my god, man!" Yeah, we we knew this was gonna happen. You're gonna be like, "Motherfucker!" No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Right. So another another data point too that came out that's showing things are headed in the right direction. That's that's looked at as a leading indicator, economic indicator for the Fed mm-hmm. is uh, jobless uh, claims. Right. Yeah. And initial jobless claims came out. Uh, I believe it was today. Uh, two hundred eighteen thousand initial jobless claims for the week. Okay. It's people applying for like I lost my job. Right. And that number is is still relatively low. Right. It's not. That's not a huge spike. Okay. But the continuing claims. They also track who, people who had been claiming that they didn't have a job and are continuing to claim that they didn't have a job. That actually rose. About another hundred thousand or so, mm. and that's a good sign. Now we did it, it was off the Thanksgiving week, so and you have to think during this time of year. I don't know how many companies are really hiring, right? So it's it could be seasonal too, right? There's a lot of seasonal hiring right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that the, these numbers might just be picking up naturally just because of the time of year that we're in. Could be. Let's go on to the Kubisi letter, my friend. Kubisi letter. All right, so. This data can get tricky, so I'm going to go slow. According to the Kibisi letter, uh, vis-a-vis X, the median new home price is now selling for $409,300, down 17.6% compared to last year. Okay? New home prices, down 17.6% compared to last year. New homes. Median new home. Right. right. Meanwhile, the median existing home is now selling for $391,800, up 3.4% compared to last year. Mm-hmm. So new homes down, existing homes up. Right. Okay. What does that mean? The gap between existing home prices and new home prices is set to close. This will be the first time since 2005 that existing home sells for more than new homes. Wow. Think about that. That's weird. Yeah. That's very weird. And I think... There's some interesting dynamics at play there. Okay. Because what naturally comes to mind for me is new home prices coming down are probably because they have to build homes that are more affordable. Well, I I think part of it was the new homes were built for mostly high-end luxury. That was a lot of the, the, because builders can get more profit margin in those properties. Okay. So I think those are having to mark prices down in that segment. Okay. I think existing homes are creeping up a little bit, but there was a period of time where new home sales were easier to get for people. They could put a down payment on it, they have to bid. They got early acceptance. They just had to wait for the property a lot, lot longer. Yes. So I think that the the levels and the rationale are starting to level out a little bit. But this article goes on to say that when old is worth more than new, you know something is broken. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting year for the housing market, especially since the Fed uh, may be cutting, cutting rates. 
So I'm very concerned about, okay, our expenses are moderating the level that they're increasing, but they're still up. Consumer debt, unprecedented levels. Auto debt, unprecedented levels. Non-household debt and aggregate, unprecedented levels. Student loan debt repayment kicking in in a full quarter by the time we hit 2024. And then I go, okay, um, what is going to be a catalyst? How is everyone going to survive this? And what is the home market's role in that? Mm -hmm. Commercial real estate we know is, frankly, well, not all commercial real estate, office in particular is really, really in trouble. Yeah, and especially because vacancy rates, right? I know that, you know, bringing people back to the office is a major point of contention for employers out there. But it's getting it's going to get to the point because the corporate debt levels are so high. And if companies didn't position themselves well enough to pay down their corporate debts, I mean, they may have to look at in order to stay alive to reduce some of their costs. And if you've already had layoffs, I mean, you have to look, take other measures, right? Maybe allowing people to stay home and cutting off some of those leases. Is this good for consumers that are interested in buying homes? Like we keep talking about how people are holding on, whether they're, they have money saved. Um, are they waiting for rates to come down or home prices to come down? Most consumers do not have money saved. Let's, let's clear that up right now. They should be saving money, but they've spent that money. That's that spike up in spending behavior that I had you highlight earlier in the spending. And that's what that really meant mm-hmm. was holiday spending is indicative of a strained consumer. Yeah. It's still increasing, but it's increasing very nominally. Inflation's going down, but people are still spending significantly more than they were in just 2020. Right. So I think the the income's strained. I think the savings is not there. I think this rush to buy is not going to be what they thought it was. Sure, a lot of equity in homes. 40% of the homes are owned like outright. It's, it's weird. It's a bizarre market. Yeah, and what you mean by that is they don't, 40% of the people out there who own homes don't have a mortgage on their homes. <clears throat> that is correct. Yes. Right? Um, I had some data here from Redfin as well. As of right now, 31% of the homes that are selling are still selling above list. Yeah. yeah. Right? Which is obviously not helping out the situation at all. Nope. Right? And that's not helping out inflation at all. Pre If you were to look at pre-pandemic levels, that number should be closer to 20%. Okay, and currently right now, also from Redfin, there's about 1.5 million homes that are listed for sale, existing homes, right? Pre-pandemic, that that number should be closer, I mean, higher than 2 million homes, right? So that's how low inventory is. Mm. So that also is not helping. Like I said, in order for this problem to help out the consumer or people who are looking to buy a home, more supply is going to have to find its way onto the market. How that happens, I don't know. Because if more, with more supply coming on, then it ha- it'll bring on more downward pressure because there won't be enough buyers because they can't afford it, right? So they'll have to be competing with sell or with buyers and other sellers to bring the prices down. You want to talk about Fed's Waller for a little bit? I like your boy Waller. You're mm-hmm. starting to like him a little bit more. A little bit. A little bit. Um, not super <laughs> not in love super by the way did you see with this isn't in the show notes that that uh 4.9 percent gdp figure got revised up to 5.2 percent i did not see that was that today that that came out i think yesterday hmm. yeah i hadn't seen it. i've been just knee deep in editing that i between editing and work i, I haven't had any time yeah before. that actually that actually came over yeah let's talk about your boy waller so oh. this from cnbc <laughs> Fed's Waller expresses confidence that policy is in the right place to bring down inflation. Fed Governor Christopher Waller said Tuesday he is increasingly confident that policy is currently well positioned to slow the economy and get inflation back to 2%. So this is like we we said, the Fed is starting to begin to lay the groundwork because they're not going to come out and flat out say we're done. But you're going to have some Fed speak come out and say that I think we're good. And then you're going to have others that come out and Go the complete opposite way. Like, we don't know yet. I think it's still too early. Let's wait and see. Yeah, but I think we're going to hear more of this than we are of the let's wait and see or like the we need to raise rates or we need to be more restrictive. Um, you know, I it's interesting to hear how this start this type of rhetoric starting to develop mm-hmm. and how the markets respond to it. But I'm I'm really worried about okay, even if they do this, 
it could be catastrophic for the housing market. If you drive values up more, man. I mean, in, look, if if they do cut rates, let's just say it, over, here he says inflation continues to ease over the next three to five months, they may, they may begin to cut rates. Okay. So that would mean when that could mean as early as February, right? February, March. Yeah. Yeah. February, March or May, June, right? We're right in line with where we said that we could see them have it happening. Let's just say they hold it for longer than that. Okay. To July, let's just say, right. How much Further, do you feel like the real estate values could come down within the next six months unless something catastrophic happens? I don't know that will in the, in the next six months. I think the housing market, if there was a correction, would take years. Yeah. It's, it, it's going to take years to, to correct itself. And I think 2024 will be a very volatile year for housing. Mm -hmm. that, that's my early guess is that it's going to be very, very um, polarizing. There'll be a period of people will jump back in there will be a period where people just aren't buying at all. Yeah. But I don't think rates are going to get as competitive as, as some people think. Yeah. I think the 10 years is going to continue to push up. Um, I wouldn't be surprised at all, and I'm not saying this is a sure thing yet, that if we saw uh, mortgage rates not below 7% for all of 2024. Yeah. Not not 100% sure in that call yet, but it seems like a possibility that I'm, I'm confident in. For mortgage rates, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that that would then mean that the uh, the ten year is not going you know down much further. Yeah, and then that's probably a, a fair statement, right? You know, generally speaking, about three percent over. We're currently around four four three ish. So yeah, mm -hmm. seven point three. I think you hover around there or higher for the rest of uh, next year. Yeah, man. Look at that clock. Look at look at that clock. You're looking at it. You're looking at it. Hard. I'm looking at it for you. You're sitting over here yawning. No, I've got a. Yeah, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> <laughs> I've been holding off that cough all, all show, man. Oh, you don't, you don't, you don't want to pull us. I was trying to like, hur, hur, hur. I, was just, I was like dying. I'm like, fuck, just keep talking. Say, keep talking. And I was just, it was bad, man. So this, we got another article here from the wall street journal. Investors are hungry for risk and holding record cash. sums. something that we mentioned um, on the show, not too long ago, how Berkshire Hathaway, which we will get into later on the show yes, is, is also doing. Uh, so stocks and bonds have surged in November with record investor balances in money market funds. Some analysts are optimistic that they have more room to run. Um, yeah, I, I know. I know that this product, right? These um, money market funds is beginning to sound really sexy for for clients. Believe it or not, no. The the sexy product everybody wants to go into is high yield savings. High yield savings, even though they they are exact same fucking thing. Yeah, you get the same percentage interest rate. In money market and high yield savings, there's not a tangible difference to you as an investor. But for some reason, everybody in the consumer side is in love with, ooh, I want a high yield savings. Ooh, I want a high yield savings. Yeah. I, I don't get it. It's the same product? If you think that rates are going to go down, mm -hmm. like the Fed's going to cut rates. Yeah. And you want to top interest rate for longer, you should be going into a CD, locking your money in. But people want the flexibility of being able to pull it out mm -hmm. and not having a, um, a penalty for doing so. Yes. Lose their interest rate. So they're they're opting for high yield savings and quick access to cash, mm -hmm. but there's plenty of money market out there, money market accounts out there that are paying just as much, if not the same, um, as as a high yield savings is. Yeah, yeah, I don't I don't get it, but it's it's a thing. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, it's it's the terminology that they like, or just the flexibility that they want. There's no cost associated with the account, right? I mean, when people are bringing in money, it has to reach a, above a certain threshold. I think it's just one of those things where every couple of years, something hip and cool is is what you're told to go after by all, everybody in the investment community. And, yeah. And, you know, years ago it was, ooh, go into CDs, and then it was go into treasuries, and then it was going to this and going to that. I think the current thing is just high-yield savings. Ooh, you got to get a high-yield savings, bro. Yeah. It's not a high-yield savings. I mean, high-yield savings just sounds phonetically cool. Right. If I say money market account, you're like, what's that? Yeah. If I say a high-yield savings, you're like, oh, it's a savings that pays a high yield. I like that. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, I know it sounds stupid, but right. that's how people think. So if investors are holding on to more cash, I mean, and we know that the Fed is beginning to look at potentially cutting rates in the first quarter, maybe second quarter of next year, mm -hmm. right? Is there a time frame within that that you're starting to see that, okay, maybe we'll begin to start start to see some M&A activity? Oh, shit. Yeah, I'm already starting to see a little bit of that pick up now. Yeah? Um, I, I think by Q1 of next year, you're going to start to see a, a pretty – pretty healthy increase in, in activity across sectors, across industries. Yeah. Better to get started earlier than wait it out. Depends on which side you're on. 
Yeah. If you're a troubled company and you don't want to have like real tangible trouble, it's better to start early than it is, you know, later. Mm -hmm. If you're a buying company, you want to see them bleed. Right. For those that don't know what's M&A. Mergers and acquisitions. Yeah. So if you're a troubled company and you, and you, you're not, you don't want to wait for your company to go bankrupt, it's let's hurry up and sell this thing. Or maybe if you're looking to buy somebody, you know, you'll continue to wait until they get into a even worse position. Right. It's it's a weird business, man. Like M and A sounds sexy and it sounds cool, and we've kind of romanticized it. Mm -hmm. But buying another company and absorbing its assets, the acquisitions part, yeah, is difficult. But I think the mergers part's even more difficult from a cultural perspective, where two similar companies come together, they merge and they blend their management teams together, mm -hmm. and then the surviving entity will you know be the, the name or they might have a merged name or something like that. But uh, that's really difficult because you're taking these individual cultures yeah blending them together with teams that had not worked together before and then who survives right yeah and department wise in the company who survives it can be very difficult yeah and it's a, and it's really challenging on everybody working there right because there's a lot of extra work that has to go into the play in, into work in order to make sure everything happens seamlessly right mm -hmm. and if if you're one of those people that works at a company that um, maybe you know maybe you don't know that or they're currently struggling and they're going through troubled times um, you would hope that the Fed begins to ease the pain a little bit sooner, right? Because maybe it helps your company that much more. Because, you know, a lot of these, a lot of corporate debt, they're on adjustable rates, right? Mm -hmm. And once rates start to come down, it's a little bit of, a little bit of ease and maybe it can allow them to cover some more operational costs, right? And as they continue to ease, it'll help them out more and more. Mm. We're going to see some interesting M&A activity. And I think, um, I think all companies are kind of prepping for it now. Mm -hmm. um, Bob Iger just came out and made some comments that he's about ready to, to kind of turn the tide a little bit at Disney and start going a little more strategic in some of the decision making. <laughs> right before uh, Elon Musk told him to go fuck himself, basically. Ba basically, yeah. he, no, he told him. He said, "Fuck you, get out. I don't need your money. You're gonna blackmail me with money." Yeah, that was wild. What con? What, you know what conference that was? Uh, I don't know, but Andrew Ross Sorkin was hosting it. Yeah, the guy from CNBC, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was the context under? He was asking him about some of the anti-Semitic stuff, right? Uh, it started off uh, just asking him about the advertisers that left, and the, for, as soon as he commented on now, to set the, the the tone here, I believe Bob Iger had been on that same stage doing his interview in that same chair just prior to Elon Musk, or, or prior to Elon Musk being on the stage giving his interview at some point that day yeah and um they, what do you say they can go fuck themselves was that what he said yeah he asked him he, like, he asked him a really vague I'm question sure he asked him a really vague question about you know advertiser money and whatnot and if, if you remember correctly disney pulled their advertisement off yeah. of their off of their platform x right yeah, formerly yeah. twitter and um, because their ad was next to something that was anti-Semitic. Right. Right. And um, I think Elon was what he neglected to say, which he should have probably said is that this is, yeah, this is the quote. If somebody's going to try to black blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go fuck yourself. And then there was a pause. It was awkwardly silent in the building. Mind you, he's sitting in front of, I don't even know how many people doubles down and says go fuck yourself arun i just sent you the link if you want to uh you want to play the actual <laughs> audio musk is that clear yeah I mean, and then he, he made a reference to yeah <laughs> he, he was pretty pointed yeah arun you want to tee it up he's scrambling yeah he's like Give shit suck on it. he sent me some stuff there you go, right here there was all of the criticism there was advertisers leaving we talked to bob Iger i hope today. they stop you hope uh, don't advertise. You don't want them to advertise. No. What do you mean? If, if somebody's going to try to blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go fuck yourself. But go fuck yourself. <laughs> is that clear? I hope it is. Hey, Bob. If you're in the audience. Well, well, let me ask you then. <laughs> he was talking about advertiser money and then he went out of his way to make sure that everyone knew that he was talking about Disney.
because Disney was the most vocal. Bob Iger, obviously being the CEO of Disney, yeah, they they made a big deal out of their their brand being represented next to something they felt was anti-Semitic. Yeah, and they threatened to pull their advertising dollars, and ultimately did. Keep in mind the context of Elon Musk. Number one, he bought the platform because he, lo he loves free speech. But he's also the richest man in the world. Using money to pressure him ain't going to work. Right. There's no one who has more of it, literally. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, I mean, you're, 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 you're going to the wrong guy with the wrong tactic. Yeah. You know what I mean? It probably would have suited Bob Iger a lot better if he would have picked up the phone and called him and said, hey, Elon I respect you. I know what you're doing with you know free speech. I get it. Uh, and you and I had this conversation earlier. I just don't want my brand next to this. What can you do? Mm -hmm. And I think you probably would have been responded, but there's a lot of money and power and a lot of like public. So basically, if you look at it from the optics, from a PR standpoint, I'm sure Rune has some thoughts on this. Bob Iger wanted to make the statement that he was going to try to leverage his position to get somebody to stop doing something they felt was anti-Semitic. Yes. And they, they, they did it in the public forum, mm -hmm. effectively using Elon Musk and his platform as press and then subsequently painting him out to be the bad person. And I'm the good person because I'm standing up, standing up for this right or wrong. I'm not saying that anybody's got a right or wrong stance on this. All I'm saying is, is that you can't use that tact with the world's wealthiest person. Mm -hmm. He has more of what you're threatening to take away than anybody else. Right. Well, do you got anything? No, I mean, like, bad PR is good PR. I mean, like... He's smart about it, just throwing his name out there, getting it. Yeah, getting feel, the conversation started. I feel like everything after that episode with Rogan, when he got backlash for you know doing what he wanted to do, smoking weed, smoking weed, right? And he realized like, yeah, fuck it, like why, why, why shouldn't I just do whatever I want? It kind of adds to his like mystique and his character, right? Now, some people might view that as like being reckless as a CEO. And I know that there was a lot of investors out there that gave him a lot of shit for it. But, like, to your point, I'm the richest man in the world. I can do whatever the fuck I want. You want to know what's reckless? If you're the CEO of, I don't know, Tesla, and uh, you hold a big clusterfuck of a delivery day <laughs> for the Cybertruck, <laughs> and you deliver 10 fucking trucks. Yeah, man. Come on, That's 10? not delivery day, bitch. That's hooking your friends up. Yeah, who got it? Yeah, that's like Nike saying, hey, everybody, we're doing a shoe drop tomorrow. We're giving 10 of them away to our friends. Yeah, just the, just the all-stars. And we're going <laughs> to we're gonna blast it all over the internet so you guys can see how cool these shoes we gave our friends are. Yeah. Don't worry, you'll get yours sometime in the future to be determined. We don't know, but you'll get them. But you can, you can watch me give these people theirs. God, just like there's something about the Cybertruck to me that is, that's cool, and then... I think we, you and I, you shared a video with me about the interior, and I was just like, wow, buzzkill, man. It's like a Model 3 interior. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's like, I think for them, it's like simplicity is like everything, but it's like, they're, it's like Keep it, in mind, it, the it seems like they're a, trying to a, like cut down on cost. It's a below $40,000 truck to start. But it can go as high as what? 50, I think. No. It's not super expensive, no. It, really? I, I mean, I got the email to price my, mine out because I'm on the, on the list, but I like the Rivian interior better. I'm You're going to get it and resell it? You can't. You can't resell it for the first year. Uh, oh, here it goes. Cybertruck comes in three configurations. Real wheel, rear wheel drive, all-wheel drive, and the so-called Cyber Beast. That's the one you need, bro. I know, that, right? That's you right there. The cheapest version of the Cybertruck will cost $60,990. Oh, I did not know that. Which is more than 50% over the price Musk floated when, when he announced the vehicle in 2019. Okay, so I had a reason for being wrong. That version, a rear wheel drive model with a battery range of 250 miles, won't be available until 2025. <laughs> Motherfucker. Tesla's offering delivery next year for the two more expensive models, including Cyber Beast, which has a price tag of nearly $100,000. Yeah, I mean, that, that's in line with, like, their Model X, right? I was going to talk shit on that price, but I paid 97 with tax title and license for my Rivian. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, look. People are already out there complaining that the paneling is all messed up. It's not in line with each other. Was it of the Cybertruck? Yeah. Not the side, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, none of the none of the Rivians that I've had. All wheel drive is seventy nine nine ninety, uh, purchase price. I mean, God. I mean, that's still cheaper than my it's Rivian. Still but. a lot, and you're paying. You're going to be paying a uh, financing rate of at least eight and a half percent. Right now, Cyber Beast is capable of more than four hundred and forty miles of range. 
Okay, that's not 500. How many miles of range? Oh, wow, I thought it was supposed to have 500. It's got 250 for the real wheel drive, 340 for the all wheel drive, and Cyber Beast has 320 plus. Is it up to having more than 440 range? Oh, interesting. Mm. I don't know. I'm I'm really happy with my Rivian. I don't I don't think I'm gonna get it. No, yeah. I mean yeah. it's it's a, it's a it's a completely different car, right? That's much bigger. Much, much bigger. Yeah. And I gotta tell you, I'm not a man who can handle size. <laughs> I I could tell. Yeah. It's very painful. It's also very ironic being that I'm so large that the size that I can handle is so average. <laughs> so average. of the vehicle that I drive. Of the of the vehicle that drives you. No, the vehicle that I drive. Am I being unclear here? <laughs> You're being unclear here. Oh. From one billionaire to another billionaire. Let's get into it. To um, No, these are not on the same level. How dare you? Blasphemy, sir. It is blasphemy. I get it, but it's still a billionaire. Charlie Munger passed away. Uh, was it today or yesterday? Yesterday. Or two days ago. Time flies. Two days ago. And um, I wasn't aware that he was having any health issues. I mean, granted, he was 99. Yes. Uh, but... I have always been a huge Charlie Munger fan. Not the least of which is he was a former attorney who made something of his life um, that was far beyond that. But he's always been practical, pragmatic, thoughtful with some of his comments. A little bit of curmudgeon every once in a while, a little, little grumpy. But I respected the man immensely, and I think that the way they handled themselves was a great case study for what people should strive to want to be. Absolutely. And if he was grumpy, it was towards the crypto bros. He did not like crypto bros. <laughs> At all. Yeah. Just to be clear, not a fan. Not even a joke. Billionaire Charlie Munger, a real estate attorney who became a nearly 60-year sidekick to Warren Buffett at Berkshire Hathaway, has died. He was 99. This from The Real Deal. The Los Angeles investor passed away Tuesday at an unidentified California hospital shy of his 100th birthday on New Year's Day. Wow, New Year's Day. Man. Damn. Though Munger made his fortune as an independent investor, he got his start in real estate. He did only five deals before getting out of that industry and heading to work with Buffett. But he left plenty of sage advice about the real estate investing, architecture, and business businesses. Um, we're going to talk about some of his best advice. Some of his best advice. Since, I mean, if you haven't done yourself the favor to look into the story and the history behind Berkshire Hathaway, you should you owe it to yourself to look into it, right? I mean, so Berkshire Hathaway is a holding company, okay, that owns a lot of businesses under it, right? Full ownership, by the way, mm -hmm. right? Some some of those businesses are, let's see here, Geico, heard of them? I think they do something called insurance. Uh, insurance, yes. Insurance, yeah. Right? And so speaking of that insurance, their insurance operations have operated at an underwriting profit for 11 consecutive years, okay? Insurance has skyrocketed, that's why. Pre-tax gain of 22 billion. Okay, you say that. You say that. You ever heard of a company called State Farm? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, they've operated an underwriting loss for 9 out of the last 13 years. Mm -hmm. So that goes to show you like that industry is not as easy as people think. It's a, it's a. No, it's very hard. It's and a some, crazy hustle. Some people in some places are getting slammed right now. Mm -hmm. the, the insurance companies are are not all making money, but the good ones can. Some other notable companies that they own completely outright: Duracell batteries, Fruit of the Loom, and Dairy Queen. You look like a Dairy Queen guy. I'm actually more of a Fruit of the Loom guy <laughs> than I am. A kind Dairy of fruity. Queen guy. Yeah, I can see that. I get that. Uh, just to be clear, because I'm, I'm not up to terms that are hip. Yeah. What exactly do you mean when you say fruity? Like you enjoy fruit loops. Isn't that what it means? No, I don't think that's what it means that's anymore. What, uh, what does it mean? Um, I believe it means that I smell bad. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So let's get into some of this advice from Mr. Munger. Quote number one, a lot of real estate isn't so good anymore. There's a lot of agony out there. That's in that's from in an April interview. My man, ninety nine, giving interviews to the Financial Times. I think that was the wild part to us, right? That he still like was very sharp. He had a lot of zeal, baby. Zeal. SAT vocabulary in full effect tonight. Him and Sam Zell. I miss Sam Zell, man. So Kermit, much. Kermit was a gangster. He was. What a G. Two of them. Lost this year. two of them. Yeah, same. God damn it. God damn you, sight bumming me out. 
There's no real controversy. We just had a couple of nutcases that went off half cocked on critiques of his dorm design at UC Santa Barbara in a 2021 interview with TRD. This guy. <laughs> we went off half cocked, Saeed. Yeah. Rune? <laughs> Are you cocked? Half cocked? Half cocked. I have a I got a quote from him too. I did some digging. Um, that I thought this one was really good and really relatable to right now. Okay. Capitalism, something that this country really grew from, really, really benefited from. Okay. We wouldn't be where we are today without capitalism. Capitalism without failure is like religion without hell. That's a good one. Okay. Right. So we're going, we're going to be going through a time of, of, of a recession and it may be a soft one. It may be a hard one. Some point in the future, there will be a hard one. That doesn't mean that the whole system failed us. No, you no, do that on purpose. No jokes. You do that on purpose. We're talking about Mr. Munger. I know. God rest his soul. God rest his soul. Don't do this to this man. Of course, there's a soft one before the hard one. There's always a soft. There might be a soft one. There if you have a hard, hard one, one, then a soft one. It's very confusing. What do you mean? That's how it works. Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> Arun, does yours work that way? How does yours work again, Chris? Yeah, you explain it. Hey, please help me understand. Mine goes soft, hard, soft. No, 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 that's not what you said. That's not what you said. No, I said it's always soft before that it's hard. No, no, no. Rewind the tapes. You know. The capitalism that I have experienced has always been soft, then it's been hard, then it's been soft. Got it. Okay. That's the order that it goes in. All right. It was very easy, then it got very difficult, then it got very easy again to make money. All right. <laughs> to make money. And then th this last one that I personally have that I wanted to share was kind of a longer one. You don't have a lot of envy. You don't have a lot of resentment. You don't overspend your income. You stay cheerful in spite of your troubles. You deal with reliable people and you do what you're supposed to do. All of these simple rules work so well to make your life better. Right? Keep it simple. You don't got to overcomplicate things. Just do what you're supposed to do every day and everything will work out. The problem is I'm supposed to do a lot of shit every day. That, that's my problem. <laughs> is my, my, my there is a list. There's got to be a priority list, though. There has to be. A hierarchy, if you will. Well, quoting the monger even more, I never had any flannel, flannel. I never had any flannel mouth baloney in operations. I dealt with quality people. I'm picking the right partners for his deals in his 20, uh, 2003 biography, Damn Right. What a gangster this guy was, man. Yeah. Forget what you know about buying fair businesses at wonderful prices. Instead, buy wonderful businesses at fair prices. Loved Costco. He was a big Costco guy. Yep. Next one. Lush landscaping. That's what sells. You spend money on trees and you get back triple. You think he was talking about um, kind of grooming? <laughs> Personal grooming? <laughs> grooming? No? Cool. Bro. I mean, there's a lot of he late He just stuff. passed, man. I know. Give it I, some time. I'm just trying to say there was more to Charlie Munger than we know. There's and a I'm, lot. There's a lot more. I'm just trying to read it. Maybe he was trolling a lot of us a long time. Yeah. You see that interview a couple months ago where he was talking about the hotel space? And he, he, he referenced, he's like, who? Uh, he, he referenced it. Was it an Indian owner, a, a Patel owner? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and people were trying to get after him. He's like, Dude, I don't care. I was, was I right? And sure enough, he was right. Yeah, he was right. Yeah. <laughs> You can be a racist when you're right. Yeah. And was I wrong? <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. Here's an area in which we have a virtually perfect record extending over many decades. We've been demonstrably foolish in almost every operation having to do with real estate that we've ever touched. That's, so That's the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders in uh, 1998 annual meeting. Something that, if you don't know... Berkshire Hathaway Class A stock, the most expensive stock in the stock market. As of today, it closed at $545,000 per share. Yeah. People will buy that one buy one share just to be able to attend these annual meetings and hear guys like Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett speak. Mm -hmm. Pretty gangster. Yeah. If you think psychology is bad, badly taught in America, you should look at corporate finance. Modern portfolio theory, it's demented. <laughs> I don't know why he just doesn't come out and say, look, man, 
I'm smarter than you. <laughs> he actually said that to Warren. He said he hints at it to Warren Buffett all the time. Apparently, if they ever like disagreed on things, his line to uh, Warren would always be like, "Warren, you're smart. Keep thinking about it. You know I'm right." And that's what he would routinely say to Warren. Jesus. God damn. Who could speak to Warren Buffett like that? Me. Stop <laughs> it, Chris. You know, once a long time ago, he was looking for like an intern. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Who, Charlie? No, Warren Buffett. And uh, I wrote a letter and applied to be an intern. Did you get any kind of response? Nope. At least you could say you did it. I know. You would have gone to Omaha? Nope. <laughs> Can I work remotely? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I want to use mail. Yeah, snail that, was, mail. that was the internet back then. Yeah, <laughs> mail. Yeah, snail mail. Exactly. Remember the Dewey Decimal System? Mm-hmm. No, you don't. You don't know the Dewey Decimal System, bro. You had to learn it when I was in school. Uh, me too. The internet you're was your library. Old, you're not that much older than me, bro. I'm like ten years older than you. I mean, you look it. I do look it. Not for long though, because uh, I went to Transcend, and I actually ordered the uh, Vitality Pack. Oh, what's that contain? Uh, MOTC and uh, Testafin. In addition to the testosterone and the, are you still taking BBC 157? No, no, no. I only did like a single cycle of that just to, Mm -hmm. for healing and get my body right. Yeah. Did you take any of that for your shoulder, by the way? No, I was off it by the time my shoulder got injured. Oh, I see. And uh, I've been sick for like the last week and a half, so I haven't been able to like physically work out anyway. So yeah, I think the shoulder is probably a little bit better, but uh, you know, we'll see. Give us some time. And why aren't you going to a doctor about it? Um, I don't believe in modern science. Got it. Wow. I'm going to become a vegan. Something tells me you're not going to become a vegan. I'm going to find a light healer, and um, <laughs> we're going to get some crystal. <laughs> I couldn't even say with a straight face. Because <laughs> my dad had a guy in the office earlier. I don't know this man. Today? Okay? Today. I don't know this man. He seemed like a wonderful dude. He was very religious. But he started talking about crystals. No, he didn't. Yeah, because he has, he makes like these braces with crystals. Oh man! And he was a wonderful person. He was a nice human. But I so badly wanted to be walking, just walk in the room and be like, "Excuse me, sir, have you always known you've been batshit crazy?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any of your friends or family? He was bro. like, "You've got to wear it on your left arm because that's the way your body receives energy." Yeah, man. Do you remember there was that time when <laughs> all the basketball players were wearing those balance? Uh, Rubber, oh, wristbands. Yeah, rubber wristbands, yeah, and they balance. were selling everybody. They would. It was that hoax where, like, all right, put your arms out. I'm gonna push. I'm gonna push one down, and the people would tip over. And then they he'd put the wristband on again, yeah, and yeah. then he would do it, and then you wouldn't tip over. And people not realizing, like, okay, now you're adjusting for it. That's why you're not yeah. tipping over, dude. Come on. So frustrating. I think that guy became a light healer. <laughs> Bro, I've got friends, friends that I follow on Instagram. Who are now into this manifestation thing? You got to manifest. Let's manifest. Look, I'm all for positive, being positive. Like, I mean, there's there's some there's something there, right? Like, believe in yourself. Fine. Yes, but don't believe in yourself in spite of reality. Like, you know, when people are like, they 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 think they're running a business. Like, I'm an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. We're building. This is the start. Watch me rise. And I'm like, how about shut the fuck up and build something? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, how about get out there and do something? Like, just because you're your own hype man doesn't mean that you're really fucking doing something every single day. Right. And I love the people who, are like, they get up and they post a picture of themselves in the cold plunge. They go to the gym, drop a quote, go about their day, and they're like, because I started with effort, I'm ending my day with effort. Bitch, please. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Just because I don't cold plunge first thing when I wake up because I'm poor and don't live in a palazzo like yeah. you boys. W- windshield is bigger than the rear view. Keep looking ahead. That kind of shit right there. That's the shit that... I <laughs> wish it was legal to throat punch somebody who says some shit remember. like that. I can't remember. There was a comedian that had a whole bit about this. Never look over your shoulder. Windshield bigger than, bigger than the rear view. Yeah, it's just <laughs> like... Wake up every day. Grind. Yeah. And the worst part about it is, is people who hear the podcast yeah, who think that... I mean, I, I get that I come off as somebody who's nice sometimes. <laughs> you do not come off as somebody who's you nice. You do not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who, who are you impersonating right there? Just the voice I remember from childhood. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but okay, some people think that you're nice. And they come up to me and they're like, hey, man, uh, I just started this. They want to talk to you about it. I'm like, cool, man, that's dope. That's congratulations. And then they start like the false positivity shit. Like what? 
And they're like, yo, bro, I just started this and we are crushing it. And I'm like, that sounds like an oxymoron. <laughs> no, like, you're not. You're crushing it. No, we're doing really good for what we thought we were going to be. That's a lot different than crushing it, bro. Yeah. yeah How long have you been doing it? Oh, like three, four months, man. It's amazing. Mm, is it? Is it? Yeah. Or do you just feel good because you're building something and you're emotionally committed to it? Well, yeah, that too. But, you know, I know it's going to be big. I thought you said you were crushing it. Yeah. And yeah. I'm just like this negative asshole who's like. No, but you got to you gotta reward them with, you know, positive reinforcement that, you know, you're proud of them for the hard work that they're doing. I do. So what I do is I wait till I see them go to the restroom, right? And then I walk in behind them. While they're at the urinal, I slap them on the butt and go, good game. Good game. <laughs> Keep up the work. Yeah. Just to be clear. This isn't this isn't at, at work. You're not slapping anybody in the butt. This is outside. No, but can I ask you a, a, an honest question? I feel like it's not going to be honest. Uh, no, it's an honest question. Okay. I do this, and I don't want anybody to feel awkward around me because I've done this my whole life, and I don't know why. Maybe I've got psychological problems. Okay? So I always look at the shoes of people pooping in the stalls. I have to. I do, too. And then I try to line them up later in the day. Oh, I don't try to line up. I, I I don't do that. That's crazy. No, no, I don't go hunting for them or anything. <laughs> but, <laughs> it sounds like you're hunting. No, 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 I don't go hunting. Like, I'm not like, let me see shoes, bitch. But if I see them later on the day, I'm like, oh, it's that guy. <laughs> Dude, I always, when I always go in and I see shoes, I go, oh, I know who that is. Yeah. This fucking guy. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, same time every day. Good for you. On a schedule. You ever go in the bathroom and see, like, no feet? And then the stall is, lo stall is locked, and then you see somebody put their feet down? Oh, that's probably me who was squatting on top of the toilet. You don't really do that, man. I don't do I don't have to. I'm scheduled in the mornings, man. I don't have to go. Did you buy the Metamucil like I told you to buy? No, I need to, though. You need to do that. Yeah. You'll never have a happier anus in your life. <laughs> you Bro, I, I swear to God, I think I've needed, like, more fiber my entire life. Yeah. The, the, my wife took it one night. I'm like, I'm not drinking that shit. I'm, we're old. I'm not, I'm not going to be old. You used to take something else. What was it? Uh, uh, psyllium husk. Psyllium husk. Yeah, which is supposed to be. It's more fibrous and dense looking, but for some reason, Metamucil just works better. All right. And it's, it's flavored. It's flavored. Yeah, like orange. Natural citrus. Makes your poop smell like oranges, too. No, it doesn't. You don't it smell it. Like doesn't. <laughs> I just wanted you to drink it and try it. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine all the people at home how many people who do tried you, it. <laughs> how many people do you fuck with like this where you tell them some fake off-the-wall type shit just to see them come back and like, hey, man, my shit didn't really smell you like You smelled so your shit? <laughs> Yeah, man, I actually pooped outside of the yeah, toilet no, so I, I can smell I, it. I clean myself and I picked it up and I smelled yeah. it. <laughs> I put it back down. That's the kind of stuff I do to people. I don't know why. I just take it off and do it. Twisted, fuck, dude. You're twisted. I think that's it. Oh, do you got anything for the no. show? No. He's like, okay, I'm not following that up. <laughs> you get nothing? Nothing to say? Nothing to contribute? Come on. Nope. All right, well. Let's, 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 let's what was your favorite part of today's show? The reviews? <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't left us a review go over and leave us a review i already said it at the beginning of the show do all the goody good stuff got anything else uh no that's it all right good night everybody bye <laughs>